Welcome to the Culture Books Podcast. This is episode 11. It's the 9th of June 2022 and we are reviewing chapter 11, Command System Stations. Stations. I'm Sheridan and I'm joined in the pod by... I'm John. No, hi guys. Um, uh, <laughs> folks, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to use gendered language. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Uh, yes, John. It's John here. Hello. How are you all? How are you, Sheridan? Good. Do you think it would be if you just walked up to people and said, hey, babes? Is that gendered? Or maybe yeah. if they're all chicks. I reckon yeah. I could do it, though. Anyway, yeah. we digress. We digress. Uh, certainly, I could not walk up to anyone and say, hey, babes. That would cause trouble. I'm just a creepy old man, and that would make me creepier. Mm. I try not to be creepy. I'm not a deliberately creepy old man. I just want to be clear. I'm just kind of an old man at this point. Uh, okay. Sheridan. Got your, another chapter. We do. What are we going to do now? You're going to do your recap and I'm going to count you in. Okay. Three, two, one, go! So there's a war in space. The culture is a group of artificial intelligence that keep pet humans. They're fighting some giant lizards. And the artificial intelligences have lost their newest and smartest uh, mind, uh, which is a big computer. And... Um, the lizards are hunting it and they've got some pet humans who are helping, meant to be helping them hunt it, but they don't know they're all together. And we're on this planet of the dead ruled by mad gods and um, they're looking for the mine. Wow. See, I paired that right back because everything else that has happened is actually irrelevant to the story. Well, to the plot. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's certainly storytelling. It told us all sorts of things about um, the universe and the galaxy. But um, in terms of the plot... We're just in the station looking for the mind. That is where we are right now. You know what they should call the mind? What? MacGuffin. MacGuffin? Oh, what's that from again? It's the whole thing that it, when you're in writing theory that a, um, a, a plot device that is sought oh, after yeah. is the MacGuffin. It doesn't actually matter what it is. Yeah. It can yeah, be the, yeah, the yeah. Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Um, the bag full of money. It's just the MacGuffin. That and is what it is. You're yes, right. The mind is the MacGuffin. Yeah. For mm. someone doing a podcast about books, I know... <laughs> Tragically little about literature <laughs> well, and its conventions. I, I guess we're going to learn some things. Um, anyway, and certainly we're going to refer to the MacGuffin again because there's a bit of a switcheroo coming up. Um, but, um, so, Sheridan failed to mention it's a 30-second recap. So, oh, um, that was me doing the plot. And now, Sheridan, you are going to give us 30 seconds. Tell us about Chapter 11 in 3, 2, 1. Hawes is having a nightmare. He wakes up, but then they all... The free company all decides to move towards the stations. Well, not to cycles. Horses kind of made them, but then they find a, like a bunch of med jewel dead and they realise there's a firefight. And then they find the mine, but there's a bunch of, or two Adirans. And a firefight ensues and they capture one and they kill the mind, but it's not really the mind. It's just a fake MacGuffin mind and Yalson's prego. Well, plenty of time to spare there. I really nailed it that time. Mm. <laughs> I don't know about nailed it, but you, you did something to it. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever it is, you did it thoroughly. Um, okay, so the dream. Um, Again with the name. He's really worried about the names. He is. And all of us who've read the book are just laughing inside every time you talk about that. Um, but um, we'll get there. Do I get to know the answer by the end of the book? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Um, anyway, so that's all good. Um, well done. So the dream, it's, I like the way they set this dream up because as soon as it said, oh, there's Zorolandra and, uh, oh, you've, you've passed the academy, you know, okay, Hawes is confused. This isn't, act, this isn't reality. This is just Hawes's, this is a dream. Yeah. It doesn't say it's a dream, but those two facts just tell you, okay, it's a dream. This is, because... We've had a lot of dreams. Do you remember how... I mean, this is a book of the 80s. People used to talk about their dreams a lot more. No one talks about their dreams anymore in 2020. No, because... And as you've pointed out to me, when I've explained my dreams to you, they're boring and no one cares. <laughs> they're boring and no one cares, but I also just think psychotherapy moved past trying to do dream therapy. Because mm, they probably um, realised that they're boring and no one cares. Yeah, I think also they medicate people who need it a lot more. <laughs> yeah, the, med the meds really do stop those dreams. <laughs> Stop all feelings. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a bit sad. But it's that's just an interesting thing about how things progress because, I mean, all literature, 
always banged on about dreams. You know, Doctor Who episodes would bang on about dreams. Mm. Um, TV dramas would be It's a Dream Sequence. And we just don't do dreams anymore as a society. Yes, that's true. Mm. Um, okay, is there anything you thought interesting in the dream? Just the name thing. Okay. Um, and because, you know, like in most dreams it was kind of boring. <laughs> I did like the um, the bit where he wakes up and, um, and then he's just resting and... Um, it describes how he thinks the, the drone must be looking at him, saying he thought about how he must look to it, a small, soft, naked thing, writhing in a hard cocoon, convulsed with illusions in its coma. I mean, that drone is really a douche, though. Why is the drone a douche? Well, he's got some real snark on him. Well, wouldn't you? You've been kidnapped, made to carry all the heavy stuff. He really... You'd be very snarky in that situation, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a drone. So? Hmm. The drones say I'm not a human. I guess. Hmm. Okay. And then... Um, what so did you find interesting about the dream? Uh, just that whole, you know, horses confused trying to process things, I guess, was what I took out of that. We don't talk about dreams anymore. Dreams are kind of lost to us. So you had the same feeling as me. Hmm. Yes. Um, so then, uh, we have, um, Horsa trying to wake up the crew and get them all going. Now. Yes. Can I please ask something? Sure. Is Balveda gay? Or are we just using the word gay to not refer to homosexuals as was sometimes done to me until the 70s, mm-hmm. but not this late? Can I read this little passage? Cause I have highlighted it. Okay, I've so, uh, yep, you go. Okay. Oh, do you want to read it then? Oh, I've got to find it. Oh. <laughs> well, you're... I've got it, I've got it, I've okay. got it. Horza, the woman said grumpily, sitting up, sitting slowly upright, flexing her shoulders and arching her neck. 20 years at my mother's side, more than I care to think of as a gay and dashing young blade, indulging in all the pleasures the culture has ever produced. One or two of maturity... 17 in contract or contact and four in special circumstances have not made me pleasant to know or quick to wake in the mornings. I'll just finish the paragraph. You wouldn't have some water to drink, would you? I've slept too long. I wasn't comfortable. It's cold and dark. I had nightmares. I thought were really horrible until I woke up and remembered what reality was like at the moment. And I mentioned water a moment or two ago. Did you hear or aren't I allowed any? Remembering that she's been tied up all yes. right. Um, yeah, I did like the, <laughs> the lengthy explanation of I am not a morning person. <laughs> but is she gay? And you tied me up. I think um, gay and dashing young blade is more a um, figure of speech than necessarily referring to sexuality. Because when that, when that happened, I was like... Whoa! Although I would note in the culture where everyone changes gender um, just by wanting to and lives forever and will be different genders at many times in their life, our concept of homosexuality and heterosexuality is a lot far behind them. Yes, that is true. But, Um, but, you know, but he doesn't really write about... even, Even though he writes about it like that he's not really embraced the full um i don't think like he's thought through some of the ramifications of yeah. yeah um i would also say though you know the line that uh, there's emphasis here on ever and we have noted that emphasis is rarely used in um in M. Banks's writing um mm. so um more than i care to think of as a gay and dashing young blade indulging in all the pleasures the culture has ever produced is saying I've put my ass around. And maybe, you know, other holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Um, anyway, so... Um, but that's that's life in the culture. It's either sitting on cold mountaintops staring at the stars or um, just in a heaving flesh pile. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you go on a yacht ride and people are just humping in the surf. <laughs> Ah, uh, what a society. Uh, you can tell Ian M. Banks was a young man when he wrote some of this stuff as well. His idea of um, utopia probably changed a bit as he got older as well. Um, <laughs> so then they're finally getting moving again. Um, and 
um, moving along at the stations, trying to find stuff, get the power back going in the complex, find the trains. Um, and then, literally, first sentence of this section, at Station 5, they found a battleground. Um, and it appears to be, I mean, A, it's where all of the Medjool are dead, I believe. Certainly four dead but Medjool. Yeah, they are and then they say, okay, they're all dead, and the, the Adherans have done more spray painting their religious symbols um, over the dead ones. They, I mean, they're really bigging them up as space Nazis at this point, aren't they? Lizard space Nazis. Well, I'm very disappointed at how they really turned. They were my heroes in the beginning. <laughs> you thought they were fighting for life. Yeah, I just yeah. thought, you know, they were sort of earnest sort of... Mm. People, you know, people. As we've said, you know, this is the commandos. They do, they're not representing True. the intellectual edge of the um, their culture, just like our special forces officers can do. Oh, yeah. Things that we yeah. wish they wouldn't. Um, okay, and the mind has basically built a Dalek, which I liked. Um, and that's what's been fighting the, the Medjool. Right. So the description is... Um, at the far end of the station, behind the half-demolished remains of one of set of access ramps, he found the scattered components of some crudely manufactured machine, a kind of gun on wheels, like a miniature armoured car. Its mangled turrets still contained some of the projectile ammunition, and more bullets were scattered like wind seeds around the flame-seared wreck. Hauser smiled slightly at the debris, weighing a handful of the unused projectiles in his hand. I assume he's thinking there's going to be more of these things around. Yeah, so I actually have to say I didn't really pick up that that was the mind. I thought maybe it could have been, like, changes or anyone. Like, the, yeah, well, changes would have been the other. But, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there was a description right early in the book when the mind is um, con- coming to consciousness in the tunnels and it's thinking about how it's going to d- defend itself mm. and maybe make some little machines to protect itself. But in the end, it made what sounds a lot like a Dalek. So... Not being a Doctor Who fan, it was that was not really a lot. Like, I didn't see that. I, I think you could have appreciated it without using the term that. <laughs> Made a little drone. Yes, okay. drone. I think, yeah. uh, and it is actually confirmed here. You know, Wobsland says, "Is it the mind that made this thing?" And Hawes is saying it must have. Um, so, yep. Uh, and I've got to say. All of the stuff in the command tunnel, I mean, the fact that they are all having dreams and nightmares is, is sort of building into this, is this is a, an incredibly oppressive space filled with dread. Yes, they don't seem happy being down there. Yeah. I mean, um, I think it's, is it Araga? Avaga. Avaga, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, he has that sort of really foreboding discussion about how well this war's never going to end the culture and the adherents are just going to keep fighting mm. until everything's destroyed mm. yeah you don't get a good sense that they're in a good place mentally <laughs> look i mean i think his assessment is one that is a, a real threat um you know the adherents won't give in either they'll keep fighting and they and the culture will just keep going at each other all the time all over the galaxy eventually and their bombs and weapons and rays will just keep getting better and better and in the end, the whole galaxy will become a battleground until they've blown up all the stars and planets and orbitals. And, I mean, you've got to remember that this book was written before the end of the Cold War when people still thought nuclear war was going to happen at any moment. And, frankly, we should probably actually be more scared of nuclear war well, now than we are. Yeah, isn't uh, nuclear war more likely now than back then? Uh, particularly around 1982, which really is the period this was being written, um, was the last moment when the Soviets were thinking they could... Um, pull off a win World War Three, right. uh, and um, so for people in the know, um, like nineteen eighty two was right up there with the Cuban Missile Crisis for um, a real risk of um, World War Three kicking off, because uh, the Americans under Reagan were basically rearming, and the, the Soviets had a window to attack in, or they'd be wouldn't be able to win. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, you know, so it's just that, that that threat of the you know constant war and there being constant conflict between two sides. It's kind of funny because you know the Ukraine wars happened and that's turning into a conflict by proxy and and all of those things. But we we haven't lived with that spectre of nuclear annihilation in quite the same way as they were in the eighties in a long time. Mm. Mm. 
That is true. It still seems funny to think that bankrupt Russia could end the world, but they have got an awful lot of nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> and they probably don't want to be humiliated. So, uh, uh, and when I say they, I'm really just talking about Putin. I'm not talking about everyone in Russia. Um... You know, and then Avager finishes, you know, and that's how it'll end, probably. They'll invent guns or drones that are even smaller, and there'll only be a few smaller and smaller machines fighting over whatever's left of the galaxy, and there'll be nobody left to know how it all started in the first place. And then uh, the drone comes in, whoa, that sounds like a lot of fun. I know. And what if things go badly? (laughs) But from the drone's point of view, all the humans and and lizards are dead, and it's just drones taking over the galaxy. He's like, yeah, this is awesome. Such snark. It was, it's a very, you know, bender in Futurama going kill all the humans. And, um, <laughs> it's a lot of veiled nastiness in yeah. that curiousness there. Um, yes. Um, and then we have the booming sound, making him think of a rock slide heard from a mine deep inside a mountain. Which I thought was a nice bit of writing. Mm. Uh, so we move on to the next station. And what do we see, Sharon? What's there? What do we see? Yes. Um, the mind. We see the mind. And what does it look like? A uh, big glowing uh, thing. An it's ellipsoid. Big... Yes. Yeah, so Silvery so yellow what's... <laughs> in the weak light. So actually... Floating in the stale air like a dead fish on the surface of a still pond. And what is the image of this podcast? An ellipsoid. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Didn't pick that up. <laughs> Woo! The it's almost just like... sneaking in from the corner. read it before. Including the stars. Um, yeah, so uh, that's what I was trying to represent. And the funny thing was I hadn't actually referenced this paragraph when I thought of what I wanted to make that artwork to look like. Um, but I, when I read this paragraph, I was like, man, I absolutely read it. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> yes. Um, and, um, but of course it turns out that it's not actually the mind. Yeah. So the the MacGuffin is a fake MacGuffin. Should we talk about this now? Mm -hmm. Well, so who created the fake mind? The mind. How do you know that though? What else is down there? Did the Adirans create it? No, the Adirans think they've captured the mind. Maybe they don't. No, they definitely think they've captured the mind. And they think they're going to take it back to the surface and... Don't you don't think they're tricking him? Well, the mind is... No, no, the mind is tricking the Adherence by sending out its little fake little drone with a um, holographic projector around it. Okay. Um, yes, I'm, I'm more than usually certain of that. And then we have a firefight in the best <laughs> tradition of... What are you saying? It's almost like you've read the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even just having read the chapter, but uh, <laughs> well, you know, like, like I'm sort of wondering, maybe there'll be like a trick or something. No, no, they, they they explain that when they go through the wreckage and find the projector that had been used, and um, and also the conversations of the Adherents, which we'll get to. But how do you know the Adherents are not lying? Why? What's their motivation? Because they want to trick Corso, who's trying to get the same. Th- well, why have they created a fake looking mind? I don't know. I just thought it maybe might be a bit more no. complicated than I thought. <laughs> You've really overcomplicated this. Um, so what we do have, though, is a firefight in all the finest traditions of Craigland's Free Company. And look, you, you said that you found a good piece of writing, mm-hmm. but I found a better one. Oh, okay. And that is when the firefight comes out, mm-hmm. Wobslin says, God's balls, I nearly filled my pants. <laughs> <laughs> God's balls. I'm going to say, that's a great, you know, Jesus Christ, God's balls. Um, and I, it's, you know, a li- neat little trick. Horsa gets, I mean, he gets his suit blasted, doesn't he? Um, so he does. His, his suit's He's useless. not in a good way, really. He yeah, really yeah. takes but, a hit. But he sort of gets knocked out. Basically, he gets knocked out and the firefight happens around him. Um... And uh, Yelson tries to stop Neeson from uh, blowing himself up, but um, just can't help Craiglin's free company, really, can you? It was uh, kind of, one thing that I found interesting about that, because you know how she, Balvedo warns him, or tries to. Oh, is it Balvedo? Okay, yep, yeah, all right. I thought it was with, Yelson. Ah, uh, no, it's with the, what do they call it? The There's a name for whatever happened to his gun. Oh, uh, the backfire. Yeah, the, yeah. whatever it is. Mm-hmm. 
And anyway, someone, one of the others comes over after it happens and mm. was like, what happened? And, mm. you know, says Bell Vader and tried to warn him. And mm. they're like, how, how would they know? How would she know? Mm. And Horse is like, well, I would have known too if I'd have seen it and been mm. conscious. Well, mm. how come those two know and none of the others do? I mean, these aren't like... Sorry, Barrel Crash is the barrel uh, crash. phrase. But basically, they're firing explosive shells so fast they're hitting each other and the, the blast is coming back towards him. I mean, these uh, people aren't, like, you know, nuns. Like, they, they engage in fights all the time with pretty crappy weaponry. Yeah. I thought they would know what this is. Uh, yeah, but they keep buying new crappy weaponry and, and this is a case of him not understanding um, his weapon because, I mean, it's not like they get to practice much. Which is actually yeah, one of I guess so. the key difference between mercenary free companies and proper soldiers is that proper soldiers get to go to a training range all the time and practice with things. Um, and, um, you know, it, anyone who's spoken to military people about time at the rages, there are many, many, many occasions when where things go a bit, well, I mean, that's how people and, die. Like, yeah, but also, you know, and the, and the, the instructors will grab people and throw them to the ground to, um, to stop the consequences of their actions coming home to roost. Um, and then Abba just starts getting really dark. Um, well, a fine little mess. Easy in, easy out. Another triumph. Yeah. <laughs> Our change of friend taking over where Cracklin left off. Um, and, uh, int- you know, Yalson, uh, we're going to have a lot to say about Yalson, but, you know, just moving straight into defending Horsa mode. Um, uh, old asshole. Yeah. Yeah, she has, well, I mean, for obvious reasons, she's a little defensive of him at the moment. Yeah. So Neeson's gun's barrel crashed and he's exploded. I mean, they did beat the Adirans, which is good. I, I've got to be honest, mm-hmm. given how freaking threatening and scary everyone says Adirans are, mm. they did beat them pretty easily. Mm. It was a little crappy. Okay. Or is this a trick? Let's do you think this is? Do you think George R. R. Martin has ruined everything for everybody? Because you're constantly thinking, "Am I going to be like led astray with some like twisty?" I mean, I guess he's not the only person that did that. But. No. Um, look, I, I wouldn't cast final judgment until we get to the end of the book. Is what I'm saying. Well, all I would say on that. Right. Okay. Um, Yes. Anyway, I mean, I thought it dwelt quite a long time on Neeson sort of gurgling and um, spitting blood. And um, I mean, that certainly added to the whole oppressive nature of being in these god awful tunnels. Do you think, though, by this point, Banks is, Banks thinks the reader has like an attachment, not just to, like the main characters, but the company, and that maybe we were meant to feel a bit. I don't think he's written enough about Neeson in particular for us to really feel anything. He's just, it's like, who's this? It's another one. I mean, what, he was drunk a couple of times? Um, yeah, true. I think if this had gone to TV, they would have had to flesh out the members of the Free Company and then these scenes would have been bigger. Mm. Um, yes. Um, and then we get to have some conversations with the Durans, which is, what did you think of that? Well, I mean, they just want, I mean, he's really goading Horsey into killing him. He's obviously not happy about being captured. I mean, it pretty much says mm. that he wants, Oh, he's definitely, he's repeatedly he, says, I want you to kill me. Yeah, which is why he keeps insulting Horsey, yeah. And Horsey's like, well, I understand Adiran, so I'm not going to kill you, pretty mm. much. Uh, and then it also turns out that the Adirans speak uh, Moraine, the culture language. Ah, yeah, it does too. Um, I did think, I mean, obviously, again, Enduran commandos are not going to be the most um, free thinkers, but they might have wanted to consider briefly for a second, how does this little monkey know it, how to speak Enduran? Um, may, maybe there's something to the fact that he's... <laughs> and doesn't Horsa, like, take him to um, Balveda, mm. as though to say, here's this culture woman I've captured... Yeah, well, he brings Balveda to him. He's oh, this yeah. is trapped in the That's wreckage. Right, yeah. yeah, and I mean, Horse is obviously doing that to be like, I am on your side. I've caught this culture woman, mm. but he doesn't really take a bite at it. Yeah, but I mean, Horsa jumps very quickly to being like, um, I'm going to report um, you, you for exceeding your orders yeah. and killing these changes. Um, and you know, and the Adirans literally like, your story bores me, little one. 
kill me now, you do smell so, and your speech grates. Ours is not a tongue for animals, which is, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's, again, it's, it's space fascist, isn't it? I really like the bit where he says, um, you aren't fit to be thrown up. It's such a good insult. Well, there's a- I'm going to save that one in my friggin' back pocket for people I don't like. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of you. Your soul is shit. Your mother should have strangled the moment she came... Your mother should have been strangled the moment she came on heat. We were going to eat the changes we killed, but they smelled like feet. <laughs> Sorry, they smelled like filth. I lost control of myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and uh, so that carries on a bit with all the um, insults. And then here's the bit that you needed... Um, Horza nodded and held up the machine in his hand when they'd investigated the wreckage. It was this, a remote drone producing a hologram of the mind. Must have had a weak force field as well, so it could be touched and pushed as though it was a solid object. But all there was inside was this. No wonder the damn thing didn't show up on our mass sensors. So the mind's still around somewhere, Yelson said. Um, what's Sokzal's response to that again? I just can't remember. To What's his response to what? Being... Oh, was he not shown that the mines are fake? No. Right. No, he's, sorry. At, the, he's at the other end of this um, Yeah, yeah, sorry. I was a bit confused. Uh, what did you think of um, Balveda's conversation with the drone? Um, are you biding your time or what? Well, the, yeah. I mean, she's obviously just trying to find avenues of, like, things that can help her. Um, so it's not surprising Mm. I mean, the drone, I mean, what's its motivation? Um, well, this is, you know, this is it. You know, Balveda's thinking he might... Balveda seems to think that he's more than just a drone. Oh, is he? Yeah. Well, that's why she's saying to him, are you biding your time or what? Yeah. Okay, and then he's like, Paristech, I'm a general purpose drone, a civilian. I have light fields, the equivalents of many fingers, but not major limbs. I can produce a cutting field, but only a few centimetres in depth, and not capable of taking on armour. Um, I like how she says, so nothing up your sleeve. Mm. And he's like, well, no sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, she said. He is funny. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's really, really funny. Um, so then we get back to insults from Adirans. Um, you are lower than hu- vermin, human. Your pathetic tricks and lies would make a yearling laugh. There must be more fat inside your thick skull than there is even on your skinny bones. You aren't fit to be thrown up. There you go, that's your line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good, there's, a few, there's a few good lines in mm-hmm. here. Um, and, you know, was, and then Horsa's using his neural stunner on him. It's like, when has that thing ever worked for, for you, Horsa? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone you use it on keeps getting up. I just don't understand how they're trapping these huge creatures. Yes. I mean, I know that he's like, oh, maybe he's got internal bleeding, which is why he's incapacitated. But mm-hmm. I don't know. These are pretty powerful. Like, we've been led to believe the whole time these are the best warriors in the world. They're super powerful. Oh, best best infantry in the galaxy. And they yeah. just seem a bit lame here. Yeah, I mean, this is a this whole chapter is built around things not being what they seem to be, though. Mm. Um. And you notice this isn't the last chapter of the book. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I do like the drone notices. Your Mr. Adequate seems remarkably unconcerned about the liberties we're taking with his train set. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe he's indifferent. I mean, at this point, Horse has no idea. Um, okay, well, now we get to the big conversation between Horza and Yelsa. Yes. Sheridan, as a woman, what do you think of this? Well, I mean, there's probably worse reactions. Uh, 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 well, you know, a friends with benefits, status unknown relationship could have to being informed that they're about to be a daddy. Yep. Now, you've been critical of Yalson's reactions to Horza in the preceding chapters. And all the time you were saying that, I was like, I bet you that you're going to have a different view on that. Oh, I have been, haven't I? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, clever. Clever writer. (laughs) 
see why these books are popular. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so all the time that Yalson was being surprisingly supportive of Horza, it's because she knew she was carrying his baby. Mm. Mm. But, I mean, she can just, like, abort it or make it happen at any time she likes. Do you think she tricked him? I don't think she knew she could get pregnant with him. I don't think she had any way to know Well, that. she says that she completely... I completely forgot that I could get pregnant with you. Uh, well, not... That, that wasn't a quote from the book. Yeah, yeah. Says. I mean, but I don't think... I mean, because, you know, th- these humanoids all over the galaxy have come from so many different genetic lines. I don't think you'd... You just assume that you couldn't um, get pregnant by accident with someone. It's an unusual thing. Well, but so from what I understand, though, different humanoid species cannot get pregnant with each other. That seems to be the status. Yeah, but they don't actually know which what their genealogies are. No, the only reason she can get pregnant with him is because mm. she's half culture. So she has this trans species ability that the culture have. Yes, but that's that's partly because you know. I, so I, if you're just two humans banging, mm, not human, the humanoids, humanoids sorry, yeah. not the same species, mm. you're like set. You you you. There's no I, need for condoms. My my read on this, well, except for venereal diseases. Which, well, yeah, yeah, look, we don't know yeah. if that exists. Though. Um, but my my read on this is just that it's incredibly unlikely for two random humanoids in the galaxy to actually be compatible to 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 have produce offspring. But in this case, um, the, 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 the dice have come up, um, you know, all sixes. So it's, it's just been incredibly lucky or unlucky. No, that's not right. Because she says, um, and I'm just finding the passage, but and I'll, I'm, I won't read the whole thing because it's really long, but she mm-hmm. talks about her dad coming from a rock. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess all planets are rocks. But and, anyway. uh, no, no, well, a rock is like an asteroid that, like, uh, Heber Hall, uh, Heber, the, um, where the changes come from. I do like how Horza, as soon as he hears, it, hears her say, you come from a rock, he's like, wait a minute, what are, whose rocks? <laughs> but then she says, I'm only half culture by birth, Horza. I left the rock soon as I was old enough to aim a gun properly. I knew the culture wasn't the place for me. Yeah. That's how I inherited the geno fixing for stra- trans species mating. Mm-hmm. I never thought about it before. I su- it's supposed to be deliberate, or at least you've got to stop thinking yourself into not getting pregnant. But it didn't work this time. Maybe yeah. I let my guard slip somehow. So the only reason she can actually have a baby with him is because she's half culture and they have that you know, ability to, like, switch themselves and stuff. Yeah, I agree, but it, it hasn't worked the way it's supposed to work either because she didn't... It, it's supposed to only work if you're deliberately wanting to get pregnant and that didn't happen in this case. Well, true, but she's also not, like, full culture and probably not in control of it. But, like, two yeah. humanoids but, but banging. She's, she's been she's been travelling around the galaxy rooting and hasn't apparently gotten knocked up before now, so... Oh, um, like... Well, ma- maybe hmm. she's not banging as many people as you think. Well, she'd only known him for a couple of days at this rando that'd pull out of space and she's jumping in his bunk. Maybe she liked him. <laughs> she must have. Um, anyway, we've covered a, a fair bit of ground on that. How did that make you feel? Well, I mean, the thing is, right, because she's like, I can get rid of it, Horsu, if you want me to. Mm. Um, which, you know, is pretty... It's obviously written by a man. but Well, hang on, I mean, the, in the culture... It's part of the canon that they can yeah, but abort she, fetuses mentally. Yes, but she is saying to him, mm. I will abort it if you want me to. But she could if she was like a fully functioning like character written by a woman. <laughs> right. Or, you know, someone that cared about women would just go, screw you, I'm having the baby. But it's she's put the... Anyway. You don't think that a woman could actually be like, I care about your thoughts on us bringing a yes, child Yes, but that's not what... She's not saying I care about your thoughts. She's like, I'm going to give the whole decision to you, Horsa. Right. It's a little bit, you know, you don't think two-dimensional. Tr- trying to be manipulative with that? Well, look, I've been wrong <laughs> so far, so maybe I'm wrong again. Right. Um, okay. But clearly he is worried. I mean, this whole name thing... Like, this yes. is all tying into this, right? Because yeah. it's like, how do I carry on, like, my lineage and my name yep. and whatever? Yep. I, I, I will say, I did not pick up on my reading of this book 
how important the name thing was. And so well done that you have picked up on that. Oh. Um, yes. Maybe um, I should do a PhD in literary study. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, so the line is, she had paid him perhaps the greatest compliment he had ever had, but the very value of it frightened him, distracted him. He felt that whatever continuity of his name or clan the woman was offering him, he could not yet build his hopes upon it. The glimmer of that potential succession seemed too weak and somehow also too temptingly defenceless to face the continuous frozen midnight of the tunnels. I mean, I would say, you know, I really wish you'd told me this before we came down into this um, <laughs> death maze. Like, well, because it totally changes things for him now. Yeah, well, you know, it's like, oh, God, radiation. You know, we can't, can't get you too exposed. To you're like, I'm a dad. I can't just die down here. Yeah, no beer and cigarettes for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do like, you know, Neeson dies and then the drone's like, oh, I didn't see any point in contacting you. There wasn't anything you could have done. Um, which is a little dismissive of the, um, the humans. And then the chapter pretty much ends. I kind of like it. It's very video game logic, um, where they look at the mass sensor and right at the very edge of the screen, straight ahead and over 26 kilometers away, there was another echo. It was no gray patch, no false trace. It was a harsh, bright point of light, like a star on the screen. Um, so finally their senses picked up the mind. Yeah. They see where it is. Do you, uh, so all the Adirans are gone now though, right? All the, Adirans, all the Adirans are in the station. They think they're dying, but they're not dead yet. Mm, so there could be more down there. No, there's not more. They're on the station and they're dying, but they're not actually dead. But it is, isn't the only one alive Zoxal? Yeah, but the other one um, is still, I think, you know, I mean, they, like, blow half its face off and piss in it and uh, or spit in its face. and. Um... When did they do that? Oh, oh, no, he's dead. That one's dead. Okay. Anyway, Zoxal isn't dead. He's just... No, he's not, He's yeah. bad at damage and they think he's dying and he's yeah. entrapped in the, the wreckage. Yes, but there's no other Adirans other than the ones we... Not that we're aware yes. of. Yes. Um, yes. So, we are at the end of this chapter... There are no new ships, which is a very disappointing chapter. There's a lot of trains. There, but there are a lot of trains. So, yeah, that's that, that's something. Although the trains don't move. Um, yet? Not yet, no. Uh, so, talk to me. Um, who's your favourite character in this episode? Ooh. It's a tough one. It's a toughie. I'm going to say Zoxal. Okay, what do you like about him? Aside from he uses really offensive language. Yeah, he's got good lines. Okay, yeah, good swears. Yeah. Okay. Um, and predictions for next chapter? I think Yelson's going to keep the baby for a bit longer. Okay. The stakes are higher with the baby. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe she dies. Is that a prediction? Mm, no, I'm not making that. Okay. Uh, just not making it yet. Okay. Not for next chapter. Okay. We haven't got far to go. We're at 79% of the book now. I think they're going to find the mind next chapter. Okay. Shall we just peek ahead? What's the name of the next chapter? The Command System Engines. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you think they get that train going? It's called Engines. There's an engine on a train, Mm. right? I've read the book. It's what you're predicting. Um, yeah, that's my prediction. They find the mind. They find the mind. Yeah. I think Zoxal is going to, like, kick some ass. Hmm. He's just faking it. Mm Mm-hmm. I would also say the movie Terminator came out around the time of this book, but, uh, yeah. Ooh. Do you think the mind, well, the mind is going to be real tough? Uh, yeah, I mean, the mind is going to be tough. The mind is... It's the boss. Ul- ultimately the boss level. Yeah, and I I keep thinking this book is about video game logic, but video games, as I'm thinking about them, didn't exist when this book was written. Like, seriously didn't exist. Um, like, Space Invaders was kind of... Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the limit. Um, so what I actually think is that a lot of video game logic came 
uh, not just reading this book, but people, a lot of people who wrote a lot of video games that we remember did read this book in the 1980s. So, um, there's, there is some interbleed, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I think we're at the end of this chapter. Um. We are. Cool. What did you think of it in general? I mean, this was a twisty, turny chapter. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of good action. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty satisfied. But then the pregos, I'm prego. Mm-hmm. Massive mic drop moment. Yeah. Yeah. Bombshell. Yeah, I mean, it, it, for, you know, um, for background here, all the last couple of weeks, I've, I've kept sort of watching Sheridan and I've kept saying, so, how's the chapter go? I thought the biggest revelation was going to be Balveda was gay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just waiting for, for, for the Yelson's pregnant thing to happen. Um, but you actually kept that very close to your chest. You didn't talk about it um, when it happened. So, well, I tried. Well, yeah. I, I didn't. Yeah. Mm. I thought that okay. was the... All right. Anyway, yes, that's the changes, everything. And also recolors all the earlier stuff where it's like, oh, Yelson's. Um... I hadn't actually thought about that because I was just okay. thinking more about the, the future of their relationship. Mm. Yeah. Ah, uh, the future of their relationship. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, and on that note, uh, we will be back as soon as Sheridan reads the next chapter. Um, it's quite funny because I keep getting told, oh, it takes so long, it takes so long. And uh, like, literally, I'll have read the next chapter by tomorrow afternoon. Yes, because but... you're a fast reader and mm. I have two jobs. I think it's more just because I'm a fast reader. But anyway, uh, folks, thank you so much for listening and um, we'll be back in your ears soon.